So, good morning everyone. It's time now to study Revelation 10, which is number 12 in our series from the book of Revelation. This is a very interesting chapter. You'll remember that uh, we finished last week in chapter 9, and there was two uh, prophetic time periods in chapter 9, 150 years and 391 years and 15 days. And that took us through to the year 1840. And we can see as we go on in Revelation 10 that 1840 to 1844 is the time period that this angel appears or subsequent to that time period. So Revelation 9 leaves us in 1840 with the fulfillment of the prophecy that the um, Sultan of uh, the Turkish world would surrender his power back to the Christian forces. If you're interested in learning more about that, go back to the last study. So I want to speak for a few moments before we launch into Revelation 10 about the principles of God's kingdom because we have been looking at many nations and many um, organizations including religious organizations and we want to see that God divides up into two main camps everyone who lives in the world those who operate according to God's ways God is love God is peace God is care, God is joy, God is happiness, God is helping your brother, brotherly love, and God doesn't use carnal weapons. In other words, God doesn't use the, um, as we saw illustrated in the life of Christ, does not use the weapons of war. But instead, Jesus uses the Word of God, the truth. He operates under truth and love, and that will be the prevailing power. But the kingdoms of the world, they fight against each other. And it's true, too, of religions of the world have been the worst offenders in many cases of embattling against each other. But God is not in these works of men. God, when the Israelites took up the sword, God was not with that method. He worked with the Israelites in the context that they had done that. But you should remember that God took Moses and put him in the wilderness for 40 years when he took up the sword against the Egyptian and slew him. Moses was retrained in the wilderness for 40 years. And then when he came back to Egypt, he came back with a shepherd's rod. And that was a rod of power. But he was to use no carnal weapons. But Moses was unable, I would say, probably able to convey those principles to the children of Israel. And when the Egyptian army, including Pharaoh, was destroyed in the Red Sea and they were washed up, the bodies of the Egyptians were washed up on the beach the Israelites went down and picked up those weapons. And because they picked up those weapons and then used them from then on, 
we have a wrong picture in the Old Testament. And when Jesus came to this earth, he overturned that in his Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48 is my favourite passage, where he says, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, and then he basically says, Love your enemies, that you can be like your Father which is in heaven. So when we're studying Revelation, and when we're studying Daniel, we should come to understand that God is looking down from heaven. God operates on the principle of love. And it says God is love. If we want to define love, look at the life of Jesus, because Jesus came to represent God's love on this earth, to show us what God is like. So we look at Christ, and Christ only loved. And because of his love, he was put on the cross after only three and a half years of public ministry. They put him on the cross because of his love, because of his kindness and his healing power. And who did that? The Jews, but also the Romans. And other people were sympathetic to putting him on the cross as well. And that is because the kingdoms of this world operate by different ways and different plans. So the kingdoms of this world, they operate in a different manner. They use force and they use deception. And that includes, in many cases, religious organisations too. And when God looks at religious organisations or king kingdoms which operate by force, operate under deception, he just classes them all together as being the kingdoms of this world, the ways of this world, because God is interested and God is going to set up a kingdom in which is love is the principle of action. Love is the truth. The way of love is more powerful than the ways of force and deception. So no matter where we are on this earth, no matter what religious belief we have, we will be judged by which way we are going to operate. Are we going to learn the way of love? If we're here in the middle somewhere, Each of us is choosing whether we're going to go more this way or more this way. And when we go the way of love and truth, God will lead us into all truth if, he, if we cooperate with him. And he will give us salvation if we follow him all the way. But if we persist in the ways of this world, force and deception... God will leave us to that choice. Leave us to that choice. Because God does not want slaves in heaven. God wants willing people, people who are willing to follow him. And that's why we see this angel who appears in the beginning of chapter 10. Now we've seen the outworkings over the trumpets up till now. And how many trumpets have we had so far? We've had six trumpets. We've had six trumpets so far. 
and the last one ended in chapter 9 last week. Now we're coming towards the seventh trumpet and we want to see what the seventh trumpet is but we know it may not get to it fully um, where it's actually mentioned in this study because it's mentioned most fully in Revelation 11 and we'll get there probably next week but there is a mention of it here in 10 as well so let's begin now in chapter 10 but I want to establish that God's kingdom is so different to the kingdoms of this world and throughout history you will see that God frowns upon kingdoms built on force and deception, cruelty and tyrants. Whether it's a government that's a tyrant, whether it's a dictator, whether it's a whole nation which is full of tyrants. God frowns upon them and he leaves them to reap what they have sown. And that's why Jesus said that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Those nations that build themselves and those religions which build themselves upon force and deception will fall. But those kingdoms which are built on love and truth, they will stand the test of time and they will stand there eternally. So those who want God's love, we must make that effort to come God's way and to embrace that love in our lives. So we read in verse 10, I think I'll just read, um, verses 20 and 21 of Revelation 9 first, because I don't think we read these last week properly. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, says here, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, and of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So, we are all going to be judged by the life that we live here upon this earth. And if we find ourselves somewhere in the middle, we need to come to this side, we don't want to go further deep into that side. And Jesus has the answers. Jesus has the power to change our lives through the rebirth, the reformation, and ministering to others. He is the one who puts the love of God in our hearts. Christ is our seed who changes and transforms our whole life. So we must repent to come from the middle to God's side. Don't go deeper into that side because that is the side of darkness and this darkness we're going to see in this world more and more as time goes on. And the darkness is manifest in different ways as we'll see as these revelation studies go on. So let's begin in verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. What a mighty angel this is. Extremely powerful angel. 
and he had in his hand, verse 2, a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left put foot on the earth. So this is an angel with an huge extent of influence. It's an angel that is taking his message, as we shall see, throughout the world. It's a very powerful angel. And this angel has a lot of similarities to the angel of Revelation 14, which we shall come to later on in a few weeks time this is an angel with a message and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he had cried seven thunders uttered their voices and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices i was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So we have this mighty angel. He conveyed to John the message of the seven thunders, but they were not for us at the time. But what was for us? Okay, well, let's go back to verse 2 now. And he had in his hand a little book open. So he had in his hand a small book. I'm sure it was different to this one, but he had a small book which was open. Now, because it was open and we're dealing with prophecy, we know that it must have been closed earlier on. The book was now open, it must have been closed, because it makes a point of saying that the book was open. So let's go back now to the book of Daniel. We want to see that there was a book in Daniel, at the end of Daniel, which was closed. Let's go back there now. We want to see that this is the same book because there's nowhere else in the scriptures where it talks about a book being closed that could be opened again. So if we go to Daniel chapter 12, And here we're talking about the um, Michael standing up in verse 1. And in verse 2 it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, so he's being given a general message of what he is to do. Shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. So the book is to be sealed even to the time of the end. Seem to have a lot on the board here. Um, the book is to, to be sealed even to the time of the end. The book is to be sealed. So which book is this? This is the book which is speaking about what is going to happen. 
that is the book that is to be opened that is to be sealed or closed and then opened again and Daniel didn't understand everything that he saw and so Daniel was um, told to not worry about it, that the book would be closed and then opened at the time of the end, and then it would be understood. So it says, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So what kind of knowledge would be increased at the time of the end? Prophetic knowledge. Prophetic knowledge. would be increased at the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Knowledge generally has been increased since the time of the end. We're living in the time of the end today. Knowledge has increased. Look at the technology, look at the transport that has gone on since the time of the end, which began in 1798. Now this time of the end also is a time where prophetic knowledge becomes widely known. People are starting to get interested in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and the other prophecies in the scriptures today. So we are living in a time where prophetic knowledge is to be increased. Let's go down the page. Um, further. And let's go to verse 7 of Daniel 12. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be a for a time, times, and a half. And when shall he, he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So here we have a prophetic time. One time and two times and half a time. And those who went with us through Daniel the book of Daniel will know that that equals 1260 years. And we will be going into this a bit later again. If you weren't there, we will be revisiting this, but I'm not going to revisit it now. But basically a time is 360, two times is 720, and half the time is 180 equals 1, 2, 6, 0 years. And that is a time prophecy from 538 to 1798. And that is when the, the Roman papacy was the dominant power in Egypt in, in the world, in Europe I should say, when the papacy was the dominant power for that period. And during that period, 
knowledge could not be um, increased because of the interference of the papacy in the study of the scriptures. The papacy made the Bible. The Bible was banned during that period. The Bible was banned by the papacy and was not allowed into the language of the common people. And people who believed the Bible, contrary to the papacy, were persecuted and put to death during those years. And so the time of the end could only begin when this power was taken away. Its influence was lost. And that happened in 1798 when the Pope was taken captive by the atheistic power of France. And we'll be looking at this too as we go on. So the papacy was preventing knowledge. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. This time is called the Dark Ages. Learning came to a standstill and a medieval power had control of the minds of men. We don't want that to happen again. So we see here in verse 7 of Daniel, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So he accomplishes to scatter the power of God's people so that they cannot extend the truth because they were so persecuted in that 1260 years by the papal power, it was impossible for them to extend the truth to the rest of the world, let alone Europe itself, because they would be put in prison, they would be tortured and burned at the stake. That's what happened to millions and millions of people. Even whole nations were wiped out at that time. That's why we say that God is love. But the kingdoms of this world operate by different principles, like wild beasts. They are described in the scriptures, wild beasts in Revelation. And then we go to verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So Daniel didn't understand. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So the words would be sealed until the time of the end. And what does this tell us? That the words would become understood after the time of the end. After 1798, these prophecies would become widely known for those who are interested in studying God's Word. And it's no surprise that people down through history have sought to understand these prophecies which have been circulated especially since 1798 because of what the people went through during the Dark Ages and what people have gone through right throughout history. God has foretold what would happen and it has happened as he has said. So let's go back now to Revelation 10 because we must understand these keys in order to understand Revelation 10. 
So we're up to verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. He lifted up his hand and he's swearing that this is the truth that he is about to utter. So we know that this is a good angel and a very powerful angel to have such a high profile and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. So he's certainly not an evil angel. He's a good angel who created heaven and the things that, that, that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. So this is something that he swear by, that there would be time no longer. Now, this time is once again prophetic time. It's prophetic time. And this prophetic time finished in 1844 when the last prophecy was fulfilled, which involved a time period. Now, since 1844, people have tried to set times for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we have all sorts of theories come up. But people who try and set time beyond 1844, not events, but time, so there's two different things. There's time prophecy. There's time prophecy, and this finishes in 1844, but then there's events. And sequences of events that are going to happen, and they can go beyond 1844. So they go right through to the end, but it doesn't tell you a date. There's no date that human beings will know for when these events will actually take place. We can see them coming, can see them getting closer and closer, but we won't actually know the day or the hour when these events will transpire. So this is the difference we're talking about when he says there will be time no longer, prophetic time. The angel is not saying that probation is closing at that time that he speaks those words. No, he's talking about prophetic time. And so when he says this, the seventh trumpet is yet to sound. So it's not the close of probation because during the time of the seventh trumpet, sometime in that time of the seventh trumpet, the gospel will be finished. The work of the gospel will finish during the time of the seventh trumpet. The sixth trumpet brought us through to 1840. And the seventh trumpet begins somewhere around this time of 1844, when the way is clear for God's work to go everywhere in the world. Now there's certain conditions that are needed for God's word to go everywhere. And we'll just mention these things momentarily, what these things are that's necessary. We're living in a time where knowledge shall be increased. And look at the knowledge that has been increased. Everywhere. But God's people, to finish his work, God's people need freedom. They need the freedom to be able to Share the truth.
freedom of religion to share the truth. They need to have bases to work from. Places where books can be printed, literature, which teach about the coming kingdom of God. which is based on love. They must operate, be able to operate from somewhere. And this freedom includes many different things. They must have resources in order to carry out this work. They need means and support to carry out this work. So those are the, the necessaries for God's people to finish the work. And already we're living in a time where these freedoms are being tried to take, be taken away from us. People are trying to take away the freedom from us to speak. The bases from which to work, they're going to try and shut down those bases. And they're try, going to try and stop those who teach the truth from carrying out this work by starving them of resources, starving them of means to work with. And so we're already coming into a time, a crunch time, when Satan is trying to close down God's work. We're in the time of the end. The opportunity is there to finish the work, to take the gospel to every nation on the earth, the real gospel, not the imitation ones. So let's read on. Verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. So sometime in the time of the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God shall be completed. And what is the mystery of God? It is Christ in you, the mystery of God. Is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery. It's Christ changing us into his image. And this image will be seen in his people right at the end of time. When we see the people, they'll have their own personality and individual characteristics. But they will have the Christ-like character according to the sphere of their influence. They'll have the gifts of the Spirit too. And we shall see some mighty manifestations of divine power in those days. But we're living in them now. The time is already here when the mystery of God is to be completed. And that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God working in us to transform our lives into his image. And there will be people who will accept the challenge of living according to the mystery of God. The mystery of God should be finished, verse 7, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven, verse 8, spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book 
which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. What did he say? He said, take the little book. You remember the book we spoke about? The book in Daniel, the book which reappears. The book in Daniel which was sealed or closed, then it reappears here in 1844 or sometime like that, but it appears to John. He sees in vision this book reappears and is open. And what is he asked to do? He says he's told to take the book. Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So, this is what he's told. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. So John wasn't afraid to go to that angel. He was such a powerful angel. Do you remember? He had feet as pillars of fire, a face as it was the sun. Would you like to go up to an angel with that power and said, say, give me the book? So John was a holy person living in the light of God's truth. And he got the book. And then it says, and he said to me, take it and eat it up. Eat the book. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So what is this book about? This book is prophecy. It has to do with prophecy, the coming of Jesus Christ. It has to do with the end of the terrible things that have come upon our earth. Don't forget that John saw horrible things in his vision as he saw these armies coming, as he saw these wars, as he saw this violence, as he saw the terrible treatment of men towards their fellow man, as he saw kingdoms rising and kingdoms falling, and the eating of the book, he eats it symbolically concerning the people at the time of the seventh trumpet. But he's also eating it because he's seeing the history which is before him. And when he absorbs the understanding of everything that takes place, from his time forward, he is, he becomes, as we say, as it says here, his belly becomes bitter. Now, poor Daniel had the same experience when he saw kingdoms rising and kingdoms falling. His he was hardly able to stand what he saw. In fact, he fainted at different times. Now, in particular, we want to see that there was a time where people from 1844 would have just such an experience. And we'll talk about that next week because we don't have time to give it full justice um, in the last few minutes. The next week we'll begin in the last two verses of uh, Revelation 10 and these two verses go directly, very directly into Revelation 11 where that begins. So there's a, a gap between the two chapters. There's a division being made there, but the story just goes on. Revelation 9, 
just goes on into verse into Revelation 10. There's some sort of interlude there, yes. But here in Revelation 10 and 11, it's just the continuous story. And so we'll take that up next week. So I hope and pray that you have all seen how different the kingdom of God operates to the kingdoms of this world. And I must say that I felt burdened as I have been studying the book of Daniel and Revelation. There's so much bad history there, but there's good history too. Those who have risen to the occasion and served God faithfully, even unto death. And we need to become that kind of people again at this time. And so this we will be addressing also in the next study as well. So I myself need uplifting as I present these things. Just as the prophets back there needed uplifting. And we'll talk about this more next week. Thank you.